and welcome to episode four of Board Game Blitz, a podcast about all things board games that you can listen to in less time than it takes to mow that oversized lawn that you just had to have and now you're kind of regretting it. In this week's episode, we'll be talking about what we've played recently, including Arkwright, The Networks, and Quicks. Our accessory of the week is Board Game Tables. We're having a discussion about games that can easily be played outside. And we look into the origins of the word rondel for our etymology segment. And now, here are your hosts, Ambie, Cassidy, and me, Crystal. First, let's talk about some games we played recently. I got to play Arkwright this week, which is a game where you're making factories and you're trying to get your company's stock price up so that you have the most value in stocks in your company. And you get... Uh, your stock price to go up by making goods and selling a bunch of goods with your factories. And in Arkwright, you get workers to run your factories, but the mechanic is you have all these little worker pieces, and when you take them, they remove pieces from the board, so that those remove spaces is how much demand there is for the goods. So when you hire the workers, then the demand goes up, and you can sell more goods. And that's pretty interesting because the workers have jobs now, so they're willing to buy things. So it's pretty thematic, even though it's a really heavy Euro game. And then also in Arkwright, you can set prices for your goods, and then the appeal of your goods is based on the price of your goods and the quality of your goods. So you can only sell as much as um, your appeal is. So like, if your goods are better, you can sell more. But if your goods are bad, then no one wants to buy them, so no one sells them, or so no one buys them. So there's a lot of interesting decisions to make, and it was really fun. And so I got to play three-player for the first time. Normally, I only play Arkwright two-player with my husband, but we had a friend in town, and we got to play three players. So it it was a lot different because there was a lot more workers being bought for everyone's factories, and there was more demand, and more things were being sold. And I also went really heavy with shipping, which is another mechanic in the game where you can like ship unsold goods and get a lot of money for it. So I was able to buy a bunch of my own stock at really low prices because when you ship, your stock stays down. And I bought out my whole company. So (laughs) that was cool. (laughs) Everyone else only had like half of their own company. (laughs) So clearly you are the best uh, factory owner (laughs) slash product seller. Okay, so I... Maybe this is an obvious answer that I'm just not, I don't realize, but why is the game called Arkwright? Like that, I knew nothing about this game before you talk, started talking about it. And now that you've described it, I, I was, had no idea that was coming. So it's interesting because I think a lot of games tend to try and give you some idea of what you're getting into just by the name. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this case, at least for me personally, I'm not familiar with the word, so... I didn't know. Okay, I'm just Googling Arkwright. There's a guy named Richard Arkwright who was an inventor during the Industrial Revolution, so it might be that. Ah, So it's like, yeah, industry, making a bunch of factories and stuff. I guess All right, so basically, (laughs) it would be like a game named Tesla, only we're more familiar with Tesla (laughs) than with Arkwright. (laughs) Pretty much, yeah. (laughs) Sorry to Mr. Arkwright's ancestors. (laughs) We swear he was probably wonderful. (laughs) Yeah, but the cover of the box has like a picture of... I don't know what it is, like mechanical gears and factory type stuff. So you can kind of tell from the cover also. Yeah, I saw it a lot at um, Origins this year. Oh, yeah, because recently also a second edition came out. I have the first edition, um, but the second edition came out this year. And there's a second edition upgrade kit that I'm ordering. I don't know when it comes, but I'm excited (laughs) for that. All right. So that was Arkwright first edition. Yes. I get to play a new title called The Networks uh, at my Wednesday night game night. And I remember I saw it at Origins and it looked interesting. And there were a lot of cards, though, so I was sort of put off at first. Um, But we pulled it out at our regular game night. And after setting up all of the cards, which took our entire giant table, and finally got to, like, dig into it, it was actually a lot of fun. So in The Networks, what you're doing is... Um, building the TV shows for your network and each person has like a different network name. So that's sort of fun. And you're building the TV shows along with hiring your stars and getting paid for the ads that you're airing with that show. 
so it was really interesting to see some of like the combinations between oh this show's like breaking bad but we're going to put this star that's supposed to be in like some sports action movie on it and then we're going to throw in this commercial that looks like it should be aired with some like old person's uh wheel of fortune or something <laughs> so it was it was a lot of fun to play and you get victory points based off of your shows and your actors and then you get money to purchase your shows and your actors from the from the ads that you acquire. So it was it was a lot of fun. It took a little longer than I expected, but I think it's because it was everyone's first time playing. That tends to happen with us too. Like it's it's hard to gauge the playtime of a game the very first time you play it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now now all I'm picturing is a version of Breaking Bad with like Dwayne the Rock Johnson as Walter White and like LeBron James as Jesse. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for putting that image into my head. Oh, you're welcome. They did have a lot of fun. Uh, all the shows looked like they were based off of real shows. There was um, How I Left Your Father and uh there yeah, that's was a much more depressing North, version. North Park instead of South Park and <laughs> some a lot of other ones that were really clever. I'm a I'm an avid TV watcher, so I feel like I definitely need to see this game in action. <laughs> yeah, you need to, you need to give it a shot. It's a lot of fun. That's very cool. A game that I wanted to talk about is Quix and technically also Quix Deluxe, which just came out fairly recently, I think. Uh, Quix was originally released in 2012. The English version of the game is published by GameRight Games, but the game started off in Germany. In Quix, uh, it's a dice rolling game where each player has a score sheet with rows of numbers in four different colors. On a player's turn, they roll two white dice and four colored dice, red, blue, yellow, and green. And what's neat about this game is on another player's turn, everyone else still has something to do, so there's not a lot of downtime. The other players are allowed to use a number from the white dice on their own score sheet on anyone's turn. And then the active player can use the white dice, and they can also use a white and a colored dice combo. The goal of the game is to cross off as many numbers on your score sheet as possible, but once you've crossed off a number, all of the numbers to the left of it now are unavailable to you and you can never cross them off. So it's a lot of kind of deciding when you're going to cross something off or if you're not. And if you can't cross anything off on your own turn, you get a penalty, which is minus five points at the end of the game. So if you don't roll well, like it can get a little bit hairy at times, but it's really simple. The way I describe it to people who aren't familiar with it is it's kind of like Yahtzee, but there's more strategy, and it's more thematic, and it's more interesting. Um, And then Quix Deluxe, which just came out fairly recently, I was actually made aware of its existence by Suzanne Sheldon on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Uh, She said she saw it at Target, and I literally 30 (laughs) minutes later drove to Target and bought it. (laughs) Which apparently was impressive to her. She was like, man, you 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 see a goal and you go for it. Uh, In uh, the deluxe version, it comes with marker boards instead of paper score sheets, which is nice because then you can use dry erase markers and you don't have to waste paper. And it uh, also has an alternate side to the boards with the game's expansion, which is not available in the United States at least anymore. I don't know if it it probably was at some point, but the German version of it is called Gemixt, like G-E-M-I-X-X-T. Uh, in English, it's called Quix Mix, and Mix has two X's on it. But that is concluded with the deluxe version of the game. And instead of having sing- rows of a single color, it mixes all the colors up into all four rows, which uh, I played this Thursday at my regular meetup group, and it was fun but actually more confusing than I thought it would be because some of the rules aren't super clear about how things happen in the deluxe version of the game in the expansion version. So I actually have to do some research on Board Game Geek. If anyone is an expert on the expansion (laughs) for that game and would like to give me some info, that would be wonderful. Because we were like, oh, this will be simple. We know how to play quicks. And then we were like, wait, when a a row gets locked out, 
by removing a die, do we do we lock that row or that color in all the rows or what? So I know I didn't get to explain the entire game, which is weird because it's pretty simple. <laughs> but uh, it's it, Quicks is just a great filler game. You can teach it to literally anyone, kids, your parents, anybody would enjoy playing it, I think. And it's cheap as well. The regular version of Quicks costs, I think, eight or nine bucks probably. And the deluxe version costs around 15 so it's a, a cheap grab as well, and I really like it. The cheapest deluxe version ever. Yeah, definitely. Sounds cool. So for this week's accessory segment, we wanted to talk about board game tables. We've already talked about board game storage in the past and ways to store your board games. But what happens when you take all of those games off the shelves and out of their storage? Where do you put them? (laughs) I hope you would play them on the table. (laughs) I mean, you know, everybody could put all the pieces on their own lap, but somehow (laughs) I feel like that wouldn't work as well. I've played games on the floor, too. As I've gotten older, sitting on the floor has become less and less comfortable. Like, I can't (laughs) even sit cross-legged anymore. It's, like, not even an option. (laughs) I know that there are a lot of options when it comes to gaming tables, because really any table can be a gaming table. I know a lot of people use their dining room table or their kitchen table to game on, but it seems like over the past, I don't know how many years, uh, dedicated board gaming tables have kind of taken off and become a lot more popular, especially with hobby board gamers. I think that has a lot to do with um, the Chic Geek or Geek Chic or whichever way you say it. <laughs> uh, since since those were the first tables I ever remember seeing like at Gen Con and Origins. And they were just ridiculously expensive because everything was handmade and custom made. And they were so, so sexy. Like the most beautiful <laughs> tables I've ever seen. But yeah. yeah, I could never like justify, oh, that is a nice table. And I can put a top on it and it can be my dining room table. And it's perfect for gaming but I was like oh, that's too much money I can't do that yeah same here like I have regular dining room tables I have like three different tables that I've gotten from hand-me-downs and stuff so I, I don't I wouldn't even have room for another one <laughs> but but yeah those are really nice and I, I'm always tempted like oh I want a gaming table but I have no room and it's really expensive they are and I mean I think a lot of board gamers tend to be kind of on the younger side like most of the gamers I know are in their 20s or 30s obviously there's gamers of all ages but I think those really expensive board gaming tables are similar to like when you would purchase a really nice piece of furniture for your house and a lot of times people in their 20s uh, tend to not be super financially well off. <laughs> I'm speaking more for myself, I'm not judging anyone else, but I now that I'm in my 30s, I'm slightly better off, I suppose. <laughs> but in my 20s, it was like, ooh, student loan debt, credit card debt, like an expensive table wasn't even on the radar for me. So for anyone who's looking for a really nice gaming table, but something maybe more affordable than the offerings the Geek Chic has... It seems like a good option right now is something from BoardGameTables.com. They've had products available for a while that are at a lower price point than Geek Chic, but they've got a Kickstarter running right now for something called the Duchess, which is, to my knowledge, the cheapest dedicated board gaming table that I've ever seen. I don't know if you guys have seen anything lower, but... No, I haven't. Nope. I was super tempted to get that table, but I just, I have so many other tables, just regular dining tables, so I don't have space for it. And when this, ep- we're actually recording this episode when the the campaign has 10 days left to go, but when this airs, it'll still have a couple days left on the clock. So we'll we'll put a link to the Kickstarter in the show notes. But yeah, the base table starts at $500.00. And with all of the uh, accessories and whatnot, the cup holders and the table topper, it's only $800, which for a really nice table, like that's, that's super cheap. It's cheaper than a really nice dining table. <laughs> it, it is. It's the same size. <laughs> yeah, it's what, I think it's uh, the play area, if I recall, is three foot by five foot. So yeah. I know the table as a whole is actually a little larger than that. I, yeah. I'm, I really, 
Is it sad that I wish I needed a new gaming table? <laughs> because I don't, really, so I have no excuse to buy this. But I kind of want one anyway. So this won't help you, but I actually did get to see this table at Origins. And it is a beautiful table. I mean, even though it's coming in pieces and you have to put it together, Ikea-esque, it's, it's a gorgeous table. And I think that anybody would be lucky to, to get one. So I did, they do have a get by a some promo going to get a free table so i signed up for that nice yeah i'm hoping for the free one (laughs) (laughs) not yours it's mine all right well that makes that makes three of us they're giving away another one on board game geek (laughs) but anyone listening shouldn't try to go for that because i'm gonna try to win it so (laughs) yeah i mean well it might actually i think the the board game geek contest will have closed i think it closes on july 5th so that'll be before this episode airs sorry everybody (laughs) suckers spoiler alert one of us won it i don't actually know that but i'm gonna try and put those vibes out into the universe i uh the, the table that i used to game on when i play at home is actually really nice and i'm shocked that i don't know more board gamers that use something similar uh my husband and i bought a poker table from somebody online it is it folds in half so it stores easily but it's also really sturdy it seats 10 people has 10 cup holders built into the railing and has a felt top that's a little bit inset from the rail like it's not fancy by any means, but it's super nice and it's perfect for board games. And I don't remember what we spent on it. I could probably Google and find something similar, but it was not very expensive. Like maybe a couple hundred dollars tops. Oh, not even that. My husband's shaking his head at me. He's <laughs> saying way. He's saying it was way lower than that even. And admittedly, wow. we got it second hand. But yeah, like I don't. I, I, no one I know has something like that. And so maybe I should start a, uh, a company that sells poker tables as board game tables and make a killing. <laughs> what do you guys game on? I actually got an extendable table from Ikea when we lived in a very tiny apartment because we didn't have a lot of room. So it was like a little square table and then it extends to like a larger rectangle table. And it's been it's been great for gaming. I think we've used it for the last I want to say four or five years. It's like our dining table slash gaming table because we game in the same area we eat, like Philistines <laughs> 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 or cavemen or whatever. I don't know. Um, but I really, I mean, it's it's been a great table. I know we're going to replace it eventually, like dining room table wise. But I think I'll keep it as a board gaming table yeah i just game on a dining room table right now um i'm gonna move in september to an act to a house and then i'll game on a different dining room table because right now the (laughs) dining room table i use is kind of old and dirty and well not dirty like (laughs) scratched up um but we were thinking of getting like mouse pad material just to put on top as like a cover and i think they sell that somewhere in bulk like big mouse pad type material stuff so i want to say is it neoprene uh I think maybe i'm not, I'm not sure name. yeah i think neoprene is what is used a lot yeah i so. could be wrong but yeah like that that stuff is nice to play on yeah because yeah the hard part is picking up cards from the table absolutely oh that's the worst like on a glass table or something trying to pick cards up although a benefit of glass is that a lot of uh, tables that can be used outdoors are made of glass. Easy to clean, easy to play on. Uh, So I think if you're looking to game outside, obviously glass tables are an option. I know some wooden tables, especially treated wood that's solid, Mm -hmm. is also good for outdoor gaming. Like picnic tables. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also plastic. Like there's foldable plastic card uh, tables or... I've gotten a big plastic table from Costco, a rectangular one that we use outside for when we barbecue and you can game on it too. Okay, so you've got a surface that you can play on outside. Let's transition into our next segment and see what games you're going to put on it. One of my favorite games to play outside is Bananagrams, mostly because I love word games. And since the tiles are solid, they're nice, solid tiles, like 
categories, tiles except plastic and not wood. They're nice and heavy so you don't have to worry about the wind blowing around and if it, you've got a nice solid table to play on then you're good to go. Spoiler alert, I was kind of stalking you on Board Game Geek because I'd never actually looked at your profile before. And that's I saw that that was your highest rated game uh, that you have rated on Board Game Geek. I love Bananagrams. It's one of my favorite <laughs> games to play. It's fast and easy, and anybody can play it as long as they like words. <laughs> <laughs> I've never really met anyone who's like, meh, I hate words. I think I've met a few. Well, I guess that might be like a people with English as a second language or something. <laughs> would be harder. Yeah, True. but it'd be a good way to learn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it'd be a little stressful. <laughs> that, uh, Bananagrams is a great example. Like, games that involve tiles, I think, are awesome for outdoors. You know, um, we we came up with a list of a few. Hive, Hanabi Deluxe, mm -hmm. Quirkle. Like, there's a lot of games that utilize just tiles and i think those are perfect for outside yeah nothing just like you said cassidy nothing's gonna get blown around um yeah. and it's just easy quick and i guess other games you can play outside are games that don't have that many pieces or like a big board that you need to set up so a lot of social deduction games don't really require like a actual table to play on so those could be good to play outside like just sitting around a circle so like the resistance or one night ultimate werewolf. I guess one night ultimate werewolf needs a table. Well, but the uh, the pieces for that game they're they're they're, they're, they're chunky thick, yeah. tiles. I mean they're not tiles, but they're yeah like they're car like that uh, cards cardboard. I don't know. It's yeah, thick. It's, like it's it would thick. not would not easily blow off of a table. I mean yeah. unless you're in like a tornado, then you know, maybe <laughs> go inside. <laughs> Let's play in this. If you're in a tornado and you're playing games outside, you have other problems. <laughs> Yeah. I grew up in the Midwest and I, I don't remember having any board gaming sessions during a tornado <laughs> warning. So But you that's a good point about social deduction games. Like technically two rooms and a boom is all cards, but every player Everybody's holds their it. own Yeah, you hold yeah, your own you cards. Your own. So you don't even need like a table or anything. No playing surface at all. Same thing for regular uh werewolf. Yeah, it's all, everybody has their own thing for that one as well. Yeah. I used to play that mm -hmm. one as ca while camping all the time, just like around the fire. Nice, but it was mafia back then. <laughs> that I'm sure we'll be playing mafia at a cookout I'm going to later today because our hostess always loves to play mafia. That's awesome. So, tile games are great for outside. Social deduction games are also great for outside, at least to some extent. Another type of game that I think often works well outside would be dexterity games. Jenga is the obvious go-to here for most people, at least even non-gamers, so to speak. Like, everybody knows Jenga, and I know that the large-scale Jenga sets have been very popular to play in outdoor settings. Yeah. But even more, like, newer dexterity games, like Flick 'em Up, assuming that you have a table to set it up on, most of those pieces have a decent amount of substance to them. So I feel like, unless, again, it's really windy, you'd be fine playing something like that outside as well. An animal upon animal, I think, would be interesting outside. <laughs> oh, that would be fun. <laughs> like, I think there's there's definitely some outliers that wouldn't work as well. I'm a big fan of Suspend, um, the one where you hang wires on each other. And I feel like even a little wind would potentially make that game unplayable. So that one's probably not as good outside. But a lot of dexterity games that involve wooden pieces or things that sit on a table, I think would probably be fine. Mm -hmm. Oh, but what about um, the people that are making like the giant versions of games to play outside? I saw somebody made a giant version of um, King of Tokyo to play outside. And I thought that was really cool. Oh, yeah, like a lawn King of Tokyo. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that is really neat. So, so basically, giant games can be played outside. Yeah. <laughs> if, so, if, you want, if you want to play a game outside that doesn't currently work outside, just make it way bigger. <laughs> just make it giant. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> For this week's board game etymology, we had a request from Sagrilarius on Board Game Geek to look at the origins of the word rondel. So thank you, Sagrilarius, for your suggestion. If anyone else has suggestions for new etymology 
words that you'd like me to explore a little further in future episodes, please feel free to let us know. A rondelle, uh, in case you're not familiar with what it actually is, is a mechanism that's utilized in a number of board games where it's a usually round shaped and it is a way of action selection where a player's choice of actions is limited by their ability to move around the rondelle, um, which will generally limit them from taking the same action repeatedly. So you have to continue moving to be able to take actions. Sometimes you can pay in whatever currency the game is using to move further. Rondelle is a Middle English word that comes from the old French word ronde, R-O-N-D, meaning round. Ronde was the feminine form of the word ront, R-O-N-T, which meant circular. All of that obviously makes a lot of sense. I personally haven't played a lot of games that utilize a rondelle, but I know some popular ones that feature this mechanic include, uh, and oh gosh, I can't pronounce this, Antique? Antique? A-N-T-I-K-E. I'm sure there's a very easy way to pronounce it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Navigator, Imperial, Murano, Shipyard, uh, Glenmore. There's a few others, but the, the rondelle is kind of not a super overused mechanic, but it seems like it's pretty popular in the games that it's in. So that is the etymology of rondelle. So thanks again, Sagrilarius, for the suggestion. So I have never heard of that word or any of those games. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I, Ever. I've actually, I know I've played one game that has a very distinct rondelle in it, but it's been a while and I cannot for the life of me remember anything about the game. Like, I know it had a rondelle and that's really all I can remember. And it might have even been one of these. Uh a gentleman in my board game group who's older, who owns almost 2,000 games. That's too many. <laughs> His house is so much fun to visit, though. <laughs> uh, he brought a game that had a rondelle. He brings, I mean, when he brings games, it's sometimes stuff that we've heard of. Sometimes it's really old stuff that we've never heard of that's really cool. But, yeah. I think the only game I've played with the rondelle is Finca. If that's the game okay. you're thinking of. <laughs> I think that's, I remember vaguely, I think, seeing that on one of the lists I was looking okay. at. So we wanted to give a shout out to Caitlin. She gave us our very first iTunes review and we were not expecting it and we were very excited to see it. She said some very nice things about our show. And so Caitlin, we're so happy that you took the time to give us a rating and we're happy that you're enjoying the show. So uh, epic virtual high five for you, Caitlin. Yay. <laughs> okay. And then another thing, um, when this show airs, I'll actually be at Dice Tower Con. And so Woo! if you're listening to this while you're, you're at Dice Tower Con, then you should go play games. And if you see me, then come say hi. Just just walk around Dice Tower Con <laughs> yelling, Ambi! Yeah, I guess. Ambi, where are you? And eventually you'll find her. Yeah. <laughs> or some other weirdo named Ambi. <laughs> I mean, how many weirdos named Ambi could there possibly be? <laughs> And that's it for this week's episode of Board Game Blitz. Visit our website, BoardGameBlitz.com, to get links to all our social media pages, including Facebook, Twitter, and our Board Game Geek Guild. Have suggestions or comments about the show? Shoot us an email at BoardGameBlitz at gmail.com. Until next time, hasta la blitza, baby. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>